JJ Lee, and I'm the mentor of nonfiction at the Writer's Studio at Simon Fraser University. And this is Stuck Unstuck at Word Vancouver. And I would like to acknowledge that this festival takes place on the unceded homelands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. Uh, as I mentioned, this panel is getting stuck and luckily also unstuck. A conversation about banging your head against the metaphorical wall, hard won writing victories, and all the strange and beautiful things we learn along the way. I want to make a special thanks to Connect UBC, the UBC Library, and UBC Robson Square for their sponsorship, which made this space available to us. This session, this session is sponsored by SFU, the Writer Studio. Yeah, give a hand, give a hand. Woohoo! Uh, and of course, we'd like to thank uh, generous donors and sponsors. So we have the Canada Arts Council, the Canada Heritage Fund, BC Gaming, Creative BC, the City of Vancouver, the Downtown um, so DBVIA, I'm not going to try to do the acronym for you, the uh, Hamber Foundation, the Joseph Wass Foundation, the Asian Canadian Writers Workshop, CWILL, C W I L L, Pace and Associates, the Federation of BC Writers, the League of Canadian Poets, yay, Sarah, <laughs> and the Writers Union of Canada. And a full list of partners can be found at wordvancouver.ca. That's wordvancouver.ca. While uh, you're there, don't forget to support the festival online by becoming a member and also uh, participating in the silent auction. That's wordvancouver.ca. Whew, that was a good one. <laughs> I felt good about that. Reason. All right, Candy Tanaka is a multiracial trans writer, artist, and librarian. Their first YA book, Baby Drag Queen was published with Orca Books in April 2023. Give her a big hand. Woo! I've actually never uh, learned how to pronounce that part of your I, name. I so gave I'm, it to you. I'm gonna, I, gave, I, know, I, I, know. I sent it in an email. <laughs> I did it. Emilia. Right, okay, so I'm going to give it. Simington. Simming, sim, sim. Okay, I, I know it now. Uh, <laughs> Amelia Simington Fetty is a theater creator broadcaster and author. Her memoir, Skid Dogs, just came out one week ago. Thank you. Uh, Emmy Sasagawa is a recipient of the Edward R. Murrow Award, the Rafe Mayer Award for Excellence in Journalism, the Canadian Online Publishing Award. Very, very nice, good work. Uh, her debut novel, Adam Wake, came out May this year. Emmy, everyone. Sarah Farmand is the co-founder of the Word Shop Collective, a boutique writing and editing firm. Her first book of poems, Pistachios in My Pocket, was published last year. Sarah, everyone. Okay. Uh, you guys don't sound rather stuck at, at all. Uh, <laughs> I, I didn't have a book last year. <laughs> uh, uh, I'll tell you, stuck. Uh, but I thought before we even begin the conversation, if we could go, uh, Candy, if you would start, why don't you tell us about your book and oh, just sure. the scope of the project, and um, and then maybe later out uh, we'll do another round where we, we we highlight we'll do a reading of the, the oh, uh, trouble sure, part. But we'll sure. say that just yeah. give us an overview of the book. Okay, so basically, Baby Drag Queen is about Ichiro, who's a transgender teen um, in his last year of high school, and he sort of works part time. I'm just reading from the back, actually, as a dishwasher <laughs> to help support his single mother. Uh, but he dreams of buying a camper van and sort of getting away, um, you know, with with his mother to sort of uh, a place that's a little bit freer because his mother's experiencing some sort of harassment at work. Um, so when a local club announces a drag prize, he wants to enter. So he's a baby drag queen just getting started. Mm. So Achiro is transgender, uh, basically AFAB, so a female at birth. And um, that's kind of what the scope is. It's a YA novel, and it's with Orca Publishers, who some of you probably know is in Victoria, which is really great. It's so nice to have local support. 
And that's kind of like a little bit of an overview of the novel. Is that? Yeah, lovely. Thank you, okay. Candy. You're Candy welcome. Talk, everyone. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Eddie, why don't you hit us with Adam Wade? Sure. Candy was so eloquent. So um, I'll also read from the back of the book. <laughs> um, so Adam Wade is my debut novel, and it basically is a story of Aki, uh, who by all accounts is a good girl, good student, and good daughter. And she's always done what her loving but demanding multiracial family expects. Uh, when she goes off to university in the UK and she's far, far from Vancouver home, she's adjusting to life in London, um, uh, filled with studies, friends, and a tentative first relationship with a closeted woman. Um, eventually, Aki um, comes out and um, ends up getting herself into sort of a violent incident, which triggers an unexpected response in her. Uh, she then discovers that brutal bar fighting relieves her stress and she begins to lead a dual existence, mm -hmm. uh, a beating and accommodating by day and brawling by night. Um, this is a novel that started in JJ's uh, <laughs> writer studio workshop, um, originally as a short story, and then it developed into uh, a book uh, with the support of Tidewater Press. Um, so my book is called Pistachios in My Pocket, and it's with At Bay Press. It came out last year, and it tells the story of my family's escape from Iran and coming to Canada as one of the first wave of Iranian immigrants that came after the Islamic Republic took over. Um, it is it follows a narrative arc, as I said. It, um, the first part of the book is about uh, our life in Iran and pre-revolution. I take us back in time to my grandmother's Iran when uh, it was... Uh, uh, by all accounts, a free or well, definitely free or country, <laughs> and um, and then the middle part is about our life in limbo, living in Europe as uh, immigrants, not knowing where we'd end up, and then the third part is about our experiences in Canada, um, and yes, um, that's it. <laughs> I I should say I did start it at, in TWS as well. Yes. <laughs> well. My name is Amelia Simmington Fetty, and I'm more props for JJ. Started my book in TWS, mm. um, inspired by um, a, a thought from JJ. Skid Dogs is about growing up in a rural, uh, lower class BC, uh, 1990s rape culture, before we knew what rape culture was and my gang of girls and how we grew up on the railroad tracks. I've got a launch tonight at the Carlton. Everyone's welcome! <laughs> All right, I guess we're going to go, like, we'll, kind of, we'll do this sweet back on you, Danny, oh, okay. if you don't mind, and I hope I'm in the shot now. Um, and sorry for leaning over you. No, 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 this is good. I was just giving you space. Okay, yeah. thank you, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so why don't we talk about your stuck moment? And I know that we, we talked a bit by email, email about pulling out a passage that represents that stuck moment. Can you talk about your stuck moment and give us a taste of the passage that reflected pre, it's the stuck moment rather than the unstuck moment? Can we talk about that? Sure. Yeah. I think my stuck moment sometimes revolves around how much to reveal, you know, personally. Um, so a lot of that is in this book, even though it's a book of sort of kind of like fiction, um, but there is a passage, I guess, you know, that kind of, uh, relates to, you know, how, when I was growing up. So I guess I'll read a little bit from that and, and talk a little bit about it, but basically, um, I'll just read like a few pages. Uh, Chiro's mom finally leaves for work, which means he can play some video games. He plays FIFA for a couple of hours and then takes a nap. When he wakes up, it surprises him to see that it's 5 p.m. already. Bored, he gets up and snoops in his mother's room. But Chiro knows he shouldn't be in there, but his mother's room has always been a mystery to him, especially the large and very full closet. He never knows what he'll find in there. Last month, he checked out some old dresses in the back that he can't remember ever seeing. She probably wore them way back when she met Dad. But Chiro moves the bulky winter coats and old hat boxes out of the way. He has to be super careful to put everything back in just the right way. I think I'll just maybe kind of stop there because I know we've got... Sure. lots of writers but just that very brief passage just you know kind of reflects you know back to my home life experience where my mom had this closet that just always seemed like a mystery to me maybe it's a metaphor for something now. <laughs> you know i'm thinking back on it but um 
I just feel that, you know, when you're, when, when I know when I was writing this book, you know, because it is a, about a transgender multiracial teen, I went back and, and thought about what it would be like if I could sort of almost relive my life again, you know, in those days, you know, with the current times, because it would be a lot different, I think, for myself. Um, so this is kind of like what a Chiro is going through. So it, um, it was a, a moment, you know, for me, just being stuck in, in writing, I had an opportunity to actually write a YA book, which is not what I had initially thought I was gonna write. Um, I went into TWS and I got accepted into the nonfiction uh, portion, not with JJ, but with Charlie uh, Demers. And um, I ended up sort of going more towards fiction because it, for me, it felt a lot freer. So that was kind of like when I started writing fiction, I'm actually working on a full length fiction novel for adults right now. But when I started writing fiction, I just found that some of those points that I would get stuck in where I wasn't too sure, like, is this like nonfiction enough? Is it real? Is it sticking to the fact? Um, I felt a little bit stuck there. So when I moved to fiction, for me, it felt a little freer. Yeah. Uh, so like just the nature of nonfiction was the first level stuckness thing you're saying, right? And yeah. then the pivot to fiction liberated you. But um, I, the, the interesting part is when we draw a lot of fiction uh, from our, our nonfiction, let's put it that way, did you feel like there was this shaky ground and you kept on sort of, were you blocked on that level? You're saying you're being blocked on that level too. It's like, oh, I'm not fictioning it up enough. Is that? Yeah, I kind of felt like, you know, there is that point where I'm like, is this, you know, you're pulling from, I was pulling from my real life in a way or my imagined real life if I was, a, you know, back then, but then also parts of my real life and thinking, you know, am I putting enough sort of fictional elements in there? And I'm, am I pushing the boundaries enough too? And I guess I did find out in a way I was because I did get a lot of negative feedback about this because it, basically it is about a transgender person. There's a lot of negative feedback right now and it's about somebody that's doing us uh, drag. So um, as you probably know, there's a lot of stuff in the news right now. So, but yeah, that's kind of where I got stuck. Um, not saying that nonfiction is not something that I wanna write, but I think for this particular kind of world, it helped free me a little bit just because as a more marginalized person, I felt there was a little bit more freedom, at least for me in that. But it did start out in, you know, kind of have its base in nonfiction a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think this is a great segue to you, Emmy, because you were in the, I don't know what you were doing with that book, to be honest, because <laughs> uh, you were in the nonfiction workshop. So can you talk a bit about what, like, uh, your journey exploring nonfiction and deciding that uh, novel writing was the way to go? Yeah, for sure. So when I joined uh, the writer's studio, I'd only ever done journalistic writing. So even the thought of doing creative nonfiction caused me a great deal of stress and anxiety. Um, and I had gone in thinking that I was going to write about my relationship with my family being mixed. Uh, halfway through the program, um, we had a check in with JJ and we were just talking about different things that have happened to me in my life and uh, an idea or um, something that to me didn't sound super interesting piqued JJ's interest. Um, and he instantly said, you need to be writing about that. Um, how can we sort of get you started? And I felt really uncomfortable because um, it dealt with coming out. It dealt with folks um, that I'm no longer, I would say, close to, uh, but also who have never come out. And so I was really concerned for their safety um, in terms of writing them into the story. Um, and it started off as a, as a, like a, a nonfiction essay. And um, the folks that in my cohort were just so supportive and just wanted to hear more and more. And I think their enthusiasm uh, sort of fueled me to keep on writing a little bit and then a little bit. And eventually um, I decided that while there are elements of the story that draw from things that have happened in my life, I didn't want it to be a memoir. And when I made the choice to uh, transition into fiction, at first it was really scary because again, I'd never written fiction, but ultimately I think it allowed the characters to breathe and exist in a way that are that is markedly different from the people in my life mm -hmm. and for the book to become its own thing. So can you read a little bit from the book and let us uh, hear maybe, I don't know if it's salient or if they cross over in that nonfiction fiction kind of thing, or even just about <laughs> characterization, you know what I mean? Sure. Yeah. Or voicing. Cause that's another thing. I'm sorry. <laughs> can we talk about, cause I, you know, the, the, was it, it was a big journey for you to stop being a journalist 
yeah in terms of voicing right was that a stuck moment too a bit yeah it was to approach things from a pseudo objective perspective and um on the other hand to, to lean into the subjectivity and like how the character is experiencing experiencing in that moment um i can yeah i'll read from it okay thank you this is not about like a moment of being stuck, right? Well, I don't know. Just read it. We'll see what it is. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll, actually, I'll just read from the prologue then. Um, and I'll read uh, from the first moment that um, Aki sort of got herself into trouble. The front door swung open and slammed against a chair admitting a frigid wind and a young South Asian man who took a seat at the bar and ordered a pint. I pulled my hair back from my face so I could see him better. He was a definition of average, short, only a couple of inches taller than me, with straight black hair perfectly parted to one side, wearing the caramel boots, acid wash jeans, and navy blue bomber jacket typical of first generation Asians on the rise. He and I were the same hue of brown, but where the hairs on my hands were thin and light, his were thick and black. There was something about his features that reminded me of Aisha, the nose, the eyebrows. He looked like Assad, or was it just me thinking all South Asian men looked the same? I inhaled deeply, stretching my arms above my head, then turned to the bar and took the last sip of my drink. Oh, a little, okay. yeah, okay. <laughs> a little teaser. A little teaser. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, leave it, leave it. Thank you, Abby, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Abby. Uh, all right. Sarah. Well, it's interesting hearing you both speak. It makes me think of um, one of the main things that kept me writing this book. And it was what Betsy Worland said in TWS. And she used to say that writing and solving writing problems happens on the page. So anytime I felt stuck, I knew that, the, that I needed to sit down and write it out. Mm. The other thing that helped me was also something I learned in TWS, which was 80% of writing is actually revision. 20% of it is writing. And so if you can, for that 20%, stay in your creative brain, uh, uh, in the right side of your head, <laughs> and just get it all out, all the things that you want to say. You just, just get it out on the page and you don't worry about grammar and capitalize, like capitalization is grammar, but you don't worry <laughs> about any of that. And you don't even worry about voice and tone, uh, whether or not your description is um, ridiculous or not. Like you just say what you want to say. Then you can go back and you can figure all of this out, which is what you both are saying that you did. And I've heard Joseph Kekwinoko Kakwinopanasam say that as well in his novel, where um, you know it starts out as, as something and then and then and then it grows into something else, right? Like, um, so for me, what I always found where I got stuck, similar to you, Candy, about um, how much of myself am I sharing, but also for me it was I say some very political things in my book. And um, even though I grew up in Canada, I still had the fear of the IRGC and what they can do, the Islamic Republic. And I remember I was writing one of my poems and the first time I had to type in Khomeini's name. And I just, like literally my fingers just jumped off the, the keyboard. And I went, like, I can't do this. Like, what am I doing? I'm gonna put, and I mean, I'm this girl with this little book in Vancouver. <laughs> so I don't know, but you know, there's that fear of like, who's going to read this and what's, what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And then, and then I had a moment and I actually had to turn to sort of like my mentors in, in art. And like, I thought about Kurt Cobain and I thought about things that are, and Joni Mitchell. And I thought about like, you know, so not per, poets per se, well, poets, but um, in a different field and just, mm -hmm what I learned from their artwork, um, which was always to, like, art has to be real. It has to be sincere. It has to be vulnerable because it's relational and you can't have a real relationship if you're being false. So if I was going to write this book, I couldn't be, I, I had to be brave. <laughs> and so um, I'll read you that poem. I, ironically, 
in the revision process, his name is out of this poem. <laughs> I thought See? it was going to be a page full of just, <laughs> so, I thought it was going to be a page of Khomeini, Khomeini, Khomeini. Yeah. <laughs> He's in here, but not in this one. Um, it's titled Discordant. Dutiful players on a chessboard, clearly defined, black and white. You both meet every expectation beautifully. Humble yet successful, hardworking, helpful. Save your money, pay in cash, enjoy life, but don't be lavish. Judgment leaves no room for error, prizes awarded later. Abruptly, an illegitimate illegitimate player enters, commissioned by England and the US, swings his bony, wrinkly, liver-spotted, thieving hand, scatters pieces, chaos. So the first part is about my, my parents. I should have mentioned that before I read, sorry. So yeah, it's about, I kind of pictured my parents, you know, kind of having this certain life and then everything changing. Thank but you, yeah. very beautiful, thank you. Thank you. Amelia, your stuck passage, stuck moment, stuck thoughts. Were they, was it was there stuck? Was it sticky? Um, I'm a I'm a playwright, um, and so this was my first attempt at narrative. Uh, so I was most stuck in. I don't know how to write a book. Like that was where I was. <laughs> I was just stuck at the very beginning. Um, and I wanted to kind of speak to the inspirational part of being stuck, which Wade Compton, again, I don't know if this is a, a writer's studio like commercial or something. <laughs> <laughs> he talked about, and I don't know if it's his stuff, he, he might have grabbed it from someone else, something called the rupture and how when you are stopped, you're just stopped and you just cannot. And that means you're about to start writing your really good book. And so in the moments where I would be stuck and frozen, I would remind myself that maybe this was a rupture. Maybe this was absolutely necessary. Maybe I needed to stop everything, rethink everything, throw everything, return to everything, take a month off. Maybe this rupture was going to bring forth what was going to be the excellence I was hoping for, which I have to say was true 100% of the time. <laughs> um, so the stuckness for me became a very sacred place that I would make myself sit in and not push through and say, I've got nothing to say right now. I can't, and I don't know why. And I'm just going to stay here until goddess comes and tells me what to say. Um, and so, yeah, that, that the rupture, I just love that. I would love you to hold on to that word if, if you can. Um, another thing, so I'll just, I'll, I'll read mine as, the other way I would get unstuck when I was writing this memoir was I would write scenes like I'm used to, like a play. Mm. I would be di I would dialogue. I would do what I'm good at. So I'm gonna just do that right now. Um, <laughs> and I've I've never read this part out loud. And I'm sorry if it's inappropriate. <laughs> um, um, Okay, I'm gonna read two and a half pages. I'm not, it's not just, you know, no, 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 okay. On the first day of grade eight, an hour before the bell, we met on the tracks to prepare. I wore a Bart Simpson t-shirt, hammer pants, and a red beanie cap with a working propeller. Bugsy was more subdued, sticking to bum equipment tank top. I noticed a few risks taken in her accessorizing. The streak bangs were sprayed higher than I'd ever seen before, and she smelled of a new scent, body shop, dewberry. <laughs> I'm not going to be late on the first day, Crystal says, standing in the same combo of 501 button flies, plaid short-sleeved shirt, and gleaming white sneakers that she wore every day. She'll be here, Max said. We're not leaving the chiclet behind. 
While my friends looked tucked in and crisp, waiting for Ames to arrive, I hoped that my bright colors and spinning propeller would evoke an untouchable confidence on this first day of high school. Doodle 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 came a high call from behind us, followed by a laugh. Turning around, we saw Ames running full tilt our way. Doodle doodle doodle, she sang out again, her thin legs galloping haphazardly, her high pony bouncing in time. You guys, you guys, she started. I thought you might have left already. I was freaking out, but I needed a slush. So we stopped at the Sev, and then I got nachos. And mom was like, no way is that going in the car, because the last time. So I had to finish them at the cheese machine. She pulled out a pack of unopened Trident, passed it to Bugsy to hold. I ate so fast, the cheese burned the roof of my mouth. But luckily, I still had some slush left. Ames opened her mouth, tilted her back, uh, tilted back to show us the red patch. So I chugged the slush. Now I'm fine. She went back to digging in her purse, found it. Ames raised a tube of grape-flavored lip chap. My lips are dry like cornflakes. She circled the tube around her lips six times fast. We've got less than 40 minutes before we have to grow up. You ready? Bugsy shoved three pieces of gum into her mouth. On the tracks, we can still be us, right? Yeah, we'll always be ourselves here. Duh. Um, since the girls had caught me spying on them at the beginning of summer, we'd gathered at the same spot almost every day to walk and talk along the rails for miles. While the girls told me which kids to steer clear of, which parents to behave around, I'd stopped thinking about my few friends I'd left behind in Ashton Creek, the promise I'd made to write weekly letters to my next door neighbor floated away. The deer runs, the evening river swims, seemed to quietly withdraw. And as my comfort in my new skin grew, I turned my back fully on the land mom had worked so hard to make our home. My lack of filter seemed novel to these girls. My bossy tendencies helped us make decisions faster. Also, they hadn't found out I'd grown up in a trailer and enough time had passed that I could bet there wouldn't be any more questions. So while nothing tangible happened on these long days of walking and talking together, for me, everything was happening. Bugsy stopped walking. Did you hear? Ryan finger banged Twyla with her tampon in. <laughs> Max froze. Bugsy enjoyed her shock, then continued. They were making out. She didn't want him to know that she was on a rag. We gathered around her. This was what horror films were made of. <laughs> <laughs> he got down her pants. She tried to pretend everything was normal, but because of the tampon, he couldn't get his finger very far up inside. Bugsy started walking again. I'm never getting finger banged, I said, rushing to keep up. Me either, said Ames, following behind while tightening the pony on her head. Then he felt it, Bugsy said. I turned from the weed. I was scuffing with my toe and faced Bugsy. What? He pulled the tampon out of her body? Yeah, she said. He pulled it out of her vagina. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all for you. Thank you. Uh, that's a rupture. I, I agree. Uh, for Emmy and Candy, uh, for Sarah and Amelia had an opportunity to talk about some of the ways that they were able to get unstuck. Mm -hmm. Can Can you tell me about the journey for you to 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 just overcome? I know that you presented the problem well. Can you talk more about the unstuck part of it? Yeah. Um, well, actually, the the novel itself has three narrative arcs that entwine. And so for me, one of the hardest things while I was writing, especially editing, was figuring out what the climax was. Um, the book is filled with fights and with moments of tension. And so at one point, it just felt like any one given thing uh, could have potentially been the climax. And what it took was rearranging the entire timeline of the novel. So literally printing sections of it, getting two large pieces of paper and creating a timeline and then shifting to see what would create the best uh, rising tension. Um, and what I landed on was originally what I thought was the climax existed somewhere in the middle of the book, uh, which from the perspective of storytelling makes absolutely no sense. Um, and so it required me to basically go and move pieces around so that 
the last three um, acts of violence occur in this little tiny section here. Actually, to be honest, in this little tiny section here, <laughs> that is the climax. And you can see that between climax and resolution, it's very little, it's basically just as long. So um, for me, the biggest uh, roadblock or moment of being stuck was figuring out the climax and the pacing of the book um, and wrapping up the three narrative arcs to then bring you into one final moment of tension. So the way that I did it is there's three uh, final acts of violence, one of them uh, which signifies the breakdown of the character's relationship with her family, especially her brother. Then the next one is the breakdown of her relationship with the woman she loves. And then finally is the breakdown of the fighting itself, of seeing fighting as a way to sort of cope with everything that's happening with her and realizing um, how much it's also taken for her from her and how it's become a source of punishment. So all of these um, scenes and chapters used to exist sprinkled throughout the book. And while there are many other moments of fighting, these through sort of uh, a puzzle exercise um, were able to build the kind of tension that I wanted before uh, you know you lift that tension and allow basically the character to grow. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Uh, Candy, what, what about you? Yeah, I think for me, um, the challenge was actually just writing a YA book. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's really structured so differently from other fiction, and especially this particular line from Orca, which is the soundings line. Um, it is uh, basically a format, like a specific format that you have to follow. So it's a specific word count for each chapter. It has to be written for a grade level that um, basically for individuals that are reading below grade level. So I found that a little bit of a challenge because at the time I was finishing up my librarian degree, my master's at U of A, and so I was writing academic writing and then also trying to bounce back to like YA writing. And I had to rewrite basically uh, a few times because a lot of the sentences, you know, I would just be writing them like I normally write. And then I would run them through this Hemingway editor, which is a really good app that um, they had recommended. And they basically tell you, you know, what the grade level is. And I had to adjust it many times. And so it was almost like I was writing it like two or three times, which is a little bit painful, but it's a, it's a really interesting structure. So that's kind of like, um, uh, you know, how I, but w the way I sort of got around it was just what I, I remember talking to a mentor before and he was just like, you know what, just don't be afraid to just write whatever you're going to write. Like, however you're going to, like, don't, I, maybe he could feel this hesitation in me because there was a lot of, you know, basically transgender and just about my own personal experience that's sort of in this novel in a sort of a roundabout way. So I did that at the beginning and it just felt so freeing. So I felt like that became unstuck. And then the editing, um, like, like Sarah mentioned, which is totally right. I mean, all that revision and editing comes later on. So and, you form know, comes later kind of thing? In, in a way for this kind of format, I felt that, you know, that was the way I had to write it. So I think, and then what also helped me become unstuck too, was just a really fortuitous like year where, you know, other little things were getting published because I hadn't had anything published for a long time. I've been in the writer's studio since like 2013, I think was when I graduated. And I just kept, just like Sarah mentioned, just keep writing and writing. And I think everyone basically on the panels mentioned, don't give up, you know, and part of my fear too was just, I didn't really submit that often. Mm. You know, I'm still like kind of stuck on that. Part of that is due to time. Like we all have a limited amount of time. It does take a long time to put submissions together and then you get rejections and you just feel like, oh, like it's almost like applying for a job. Mm -hmm. It's like it's, it's like another part-time job, right? So, you know, once I got over that sort of thing where I was like, you know what, hey, I've submitted just a few things and they got, you know, they actually got published. I'm like, what would happen if I submit more? So, you know, so now I'm on this thing where, you know, it, it helped me get unstuck, just getting one little thing published. It was like basically an essay in, um, in resonance, which is one of the, again, another commercial for TWS is a, a TWS, um, a lot of collaborators in there. It's it's uh, authored by Andrew and Laura that are both with the TWS program. So got a little essay published in there. And then a few other things came with like a little, a couple really short flash fiction pieces in this anthology here. So it was like a really good year for me. And I think I felt a little bit more unstuck so I could, you know, hopefully 
you know, we'll see what happens, but yeah. Well, thank you, Kennedy. Thank you for yeah, sharing no that problem. journey. Um, I think I'm going to look at, sorry, not to be rude. I just looked at my watch, pardon me. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's one thirty six, and I thought we would open the floor for some questions or we have, we have war stories to share amongst ourselves and we could ignore you entirely, but, uh, uh, but I thought if there were some questions or people want to share some of their stuck moments, and I think we have a crack team of advisors to unstuck you right now. And so if there are any questions about the role or like, I, you know, sorry, I, I do want to segue a bit or create a, a new uh, uh, thread of thought here. It seems to me that fear is actually one of the strongest forces that creates stuckness, you know, in the writer that we that we have here today, mm -hmm. you know. And so if we want to address that issue, uh, we can talk about fear of writing, uh, or whatever that could possibly mean, or fear of being read, even, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> and fear of being judged. And so if you have any questions about that role and how to overcome it, I think that was actually a big part of the workshop, like our time together in the mm -hmm. workshop at, at TWS, I imagine too, was addressing your issues of fear or risk that we took. So, I know that, yes, please. Oh. Hi. Um, I, there's something I want to ask, but now I feel like you really want me to ask. How do you handle the fear? <laughs> no, 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 please. No, you're, you're welcome. Yeah. You want to go with the, you want to go with the How do you handle the fear? You want to go with that? I don't know how I handle the yeah. fear. Yeah. I, I was going to ask how much do you use the tool of brainstorming? Like, if you're stuck on something, How useful is brainstorming is the question. Anyone want to take, pick up on uh, brainstorming here? Pull it, maybe pull it sure, brainstorming. Sure. <laughs> I, um, I think it's, yeah, I think it's really helpful. Um, I want to say it's like, I did find a lot of my, now I was lucky because a lot of this I wrote in the TWS program. So I had my, I had poets and also friends from outside the poetry group that we talked about the book quite a bit. So I think it was maybe like a percentage of it, of, 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 um, of the issues that I faced, I did talk out, but I, I do also believe, I want to say it's almost 50, 50. I think a lot of it too, is just like sitting down, like Betsy Worland said, and just getting it on the page. And that's what really helped me overcome it for me personally. And, and sorry, just for a clarification on your question about brainstorming. Sometimes brainstorming implies kicking it around with other people. Do you yeah. mean that kind of brainstorming or more yeah, yeah. hitting, I mean, hitting it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's I important. Say this is like, I like things, and other people say like, I'm not as interested, but that's what yeah. I'm trying to do. Yeah, for me, 50 50. Yeah. Yeah, so you, you got to toss it around with other people. Yeah. Right? What, what about you, Amelia? Did that happen? I'm, I'm going to say I, I, am, I work collaboratively. That's my jam. I brainstorm everything with everyone. And then it leads to a lot of cooks in the kitchen and you're left <laughs> alone, still stuck uh -huh. with more ideas. And there's been times where I've even gone down the route of this is a brilliant idea. Thank you. You helped me crack it. And I've gotten it down and I've realized, but it's not mine anymore. That was their idea. God damn. So, um, yes, great. It's good to share. It's important to engage with your community and get it out of you but you will be with you figuring it out and making the decision in the end. Yeah, I think what I'll add to that is, I think Stephen King said that um, like you have the door closed and then the door open. So the first time you're writing your draft, the door is closed. It's you writing the draft and simmering in your ideas and thoughts and putting them down on the page. And when you're finally ready to show it, to you know, people that you trust, that's when the door open process begins. Now, I think that's a little bit prescriptive and I think that you can sort of define when you want that door to open. Uh, but certainly I think you need to be at a place where you're comfortable enough with your story and that you have a sense of where it's going, uh, that the people that are around you and talking to you aren't gonna dictate the path that you take, if that makes any sense. So for example, the person sitting at the front here, Julie, uh, she was in my TWS cohort. And over the past five years, we've stayed in touch. We've gone on writing retreats together. She's read multiple versions of elements of my manuscript. And so that's an example of like a brainstorming that has helped me. But before showing it to her, I had to reach a stage where I felt, okay, like I'm confident in this 
chunk of whatever that I've put together that I'm comfortable enough standing behind. And I know um, the questions that I want to ask this person. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Would you say that before you open the door, you get a feeling of what the story is about? Yeah. Yeah. Even if all the pieces aren't in the right order, because they weren't until the last year. Thank you. Thank you, Emmy. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kenny, any thoughts about the whole brainstorming part? Yeah, I, I'm actually a very introverted writer. Um, I did go through the TWS program and, you know, there were like lots of workshopping sessions and, you know, you take everybody's feedback for, you know, what it is. But um, for for the writing that I've been doing recently in these three things, I actually wrote almost all of it just on my own. I didn't let anyone see it until it got to the editing stage. Maybe I'm sort of like a a weirdo in that, in that aspect that Savant, I'm like, Savant. Yeah. <laughs> I keep it, I keep it very close to me and uh, do multiple revisions. And, um, you know, I find the editors are just really great, but I, I kind of really want to protect my, my vision and, you know, in how it was just because I feel that, you know, everybody has their own unique perspective and I just don't want it to be influenced by other, you know, what, you know, plot twists that other people think it might go in a different direction. So maybe, you know, anyways, that's sort of how I've been dealing with it. I mean, and I also pull from lots of different, I really like to pull from lots of different areas in my life of, of my interests. So like, I also am really, you know, I have an artist background. So I like to pull in from that uh, area as well, like sort of into my writing. And so, um, you know, that's how I deal with it. everybody does stuff differently. But I found that, you know, I am actually really introverted when I'm writing. And it, you know, I'd been advised to like, you know, basically workshop things and let other people see it. But I'm like, no, I don't really want to. <laughs> you know? So that's just how I work. Yeah. Do, you, do you mind if I jump in with a, a response? Is that okay with you in the group here? It, uh, I, uh, there is this moment where courage of your convictions needs to kick in. Mm-hmm. Um, I think for you know, for Emmy and Amelia, because you were in my work, there was a moment where I basically wanted to just kick you out of the workshop, essentially, and say, can you just write it and not come back with your, like, stop submitting what you're writing and just come to the workshop and don't submit. And like, I, I think that happened, like, I think we've had conversations kind of like that, where, you know, you need to stop sharing it and you need to just believe that you can write it and write it. And I think that's an important step to take at some point. Um, uh, so, uh, thank you for your question, and thank you for letting me uh, provide a little bit of an answer as well. Yes, please. Um, I was going to ask a, a complimentary question, actually. Um, uh, as curious about when you're doing, I'm much more like you as an introverted writer, when you're stuck and you're in your room by yourself and you need to try something new to unstick yourself, mm. um, what what do you do? Do you have any tricks? Like, what kind of brainstorming then do you do? Do you make lists? Do you outline? Do you re Like, what what actual tasks do you do? The craft. I'll repeat the question just in case the mic didn't pick up. I know it's omnidirectional, but we'll give it a shot. So the question was, when you're on your own, in your room, and you're stuck, what techniques do you engage in to get unstuck? Hopefully that captures it. <laughs> Okay. I, I really want to share this little piece and I think it um, I again I learned it from Betsy Warland and Yoninia Curtin and it was to have companion your companion pieces with you when you're starting a book mm-hmm. and so it can be b- books or mm-hmm. art, like music or artwork or whatever so I had like a, a group of I had um, I mentioned Kurt Cobain and Joni Mitchell because I had like their music with me and then I had um poetry book with me, Margaret Atwood's um, in the burning house, that one, yeah, morning after the burning house. And um, those were my companions. So anytime I felt that way, I would actually either listen to the music or I would open the book and it would just, and you know, and I think part of it was like, if someone can finish something, I can finish something too. Um, Yeah. Yeah, I take kind of a more of a, I would say, stop everything and go for a walk. <laughs> Just stop trying. That's what I would try. I think like um, my brain is too activated. I will not find my way through. Stop. Um, I treat writing like as a sacred practice, as I think it is. Um, and it, I mean, it may sound ridiculous, but clean your office, go for a walk, light a candle, 
like change it up energetically mm. ask ask sit down for five minutes and say, I'm a vessel, I'm a vessel, I'm a vessel. <laughs> like do all the things other than try to keep writing. Maybe is an option too. Yeah, I think both of what you said has resonated with me. Um, I try to set like small achievable goals. Uh, so if all I think I'm capable of doing today is writing three sentences, uh, anything beyond that is a huge success. And I think it helps to feel like you've accomplished something. Um, I go for like cycles. I, I, I like riding my bike and I usually have what I think are moments of like literary epiphany. Um, it's probably not, um, <laughs> but it feels that way when you're cycling where I have to like stop and I'll write it down and then I'll try to incorporate that when I get back uh, home and then stimuli so like scents sounds taste can really put you in a writing mood um i also you know because this book started off as nonfiction, there actually are a lot of like songs and sounds and you know like smells that put me in a space where i was 19 years old living in london and going to university and so even like bringing those back into my life would put me in a mood for like inhabiting that space mm -hmm. um and then i think the last thing that i'll say is if you really can't get anything down read like it's it can be so inspiring to read someone uh someone's work who you admire and even if it you know the next you know, page or so that you write are basically a, pas a pastiche of whatever that one person has written, it will get your juices flowing again. You can always go back and revisit it and make it your own. Yeah. That's, that's great. Thank you. Any, any thoughts? Um, I think like as Emmy and, and um, Emilia mentioned too, is like physical exercise, definitely. Like walking is one of my favorite things to do. I love, to, I live in the West End, so I love to go on walks, you know, there um, and check check out the scenery and stuff. But I also find too that, you know, like I mentioned, looking at different areas. So like I, I might pull a book of art off the off my bookshelf and just kind of look at that for a little bit. Um, also just sitting with being stuck. Just, I think Amelia mentioned that to you, just kind of sit there and you just kind of, it really feels uncomfortable because you just feel like you're like a failure or something because you just can't move <laughs> past it. But it really does help to just sit there and just like realize that, hey, I am so stuck. Do I even know what I'm doing here? Like what's going on? And then I just like sit there for a bit, um, you know, and a lot of times you just have to, I think what, what also we learned in the writer's studio is sometimes you just have to put your novel away for like a, a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. So like you just shove it in a drawer, do not look at it for a couple months even you know, depending on, on where you're at, unless you're at the, obviously the stage where you need to submit something and then pull it out again and look at it. And then sometimes I'm like, wow, that is actually not too bad that I wrote that. I'm like, okay. And then there's a lot of stuff that I see that I'm like, no, oh, that's awful. Like cross that out. Um, you know, so that kind of, those kinds of things uh, really help. And then I'm also a fan of like blocking out time. So I'll just like block out, oh, I can write for two hours and then that's it. And then I'll go to my K-drama on Netflix, you know, because, like, you know, when things are so different, it really helps in your brain to just focus on something that's so different. Because I'm like, K-dramas just relieve me of all my stress, especially when I was doing academic writing, too. And I do like to look at academic texts or like texts that are a little bit more dense sometimes, too, because there's lots of really good nuggets that you can just like it stimulates your brain and then helps you kind of like bring something that's a little bit lighter to your page. So those are kind of things that I look at. Thank you, Candy. Yeah, no problem. Yes, please. My question's about like revisiting a piece that has been stuck with me for quite a while. Um, and I've noticed sometimes like when you get back to it, like, it's been quite a while and you just start writing again for lessons, but then you've almost got like a different voice. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just wondering how you deal with that. So do you think uh, the challenge is when you come back to look at an older work, um, it suddenly doesn't feel like you can enter that writing voice because you've changed yeah. somehow, right? When you do start writing again, yeah, it's kind of like they don't match, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. right. So Adam White was written over the course of five years, so I definitely experienced that. And um, through it, I started also doing a lot of anti-racism work in my like day job. So. Um, 
the latter half of the book became imbued with its like critical race theory and like uh, language that um, probably 19 year old Aki wouldn't have known um, when the book started. And so I think it's a matter of figuring out is there one of the two voices that suit that piece better? And if there is, then making that choice and transitioning. Um, it's much better to go back to the work and uh, make it cohesive and make it um, one complete piece as opposed to, you know, I don't want to go back. Then might as well not <laughs> like go back to writing it in the first place. Um, but there's also, I think the thing with like creative writing is that if you really want it, you can make a change in voice feel intentional. Uh, you can make it, you can have it be like a subplot, right? And so part of what I did in the book is that I, I realized that I wanted that language to stay, but I needed the character to get there. Mm. And so I needed to create opportunities for the character mm. to learn that language. And so I think that if you want there to be that transition and that shift, there are ways to incorporate it, but if to you it feels very clear that the voice you have now that you've come back to it after six months, and that's really how the story should be told, go back to the beginning and you know write it out with that voice. Uh, it's ten minutes to yes. We'll Hang do on, a uh, couple. Can I just say one? Quick oh yeah, my, a big. I'm going to say something that might like be intense for you. <laughs> um. Like every time we come back to the page, we are different, right? Like I'm different from my therapy session, I've changed. I'm come back, I'm different. <laughs> and so um, write your book, write your book. Because we're always gonna be different. You're always gonna be changing. In six months will be different, in 12 months will be different. And so just get it down and get it out. And then in five years, you'll be so embarrassed that you wrote it because <laughs> it'll be so different. But just write it, get like, you know what I mean? Because we're constantly changing. Kevin yeah. Chong, long listed for the Giller, uh, taught at TWS, and when he was at TWS, he advised students to write forward. You will always be changing. Just write the next part. Don't go back. Keep going forward. Mm -hmm. Always go forward. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not sure if you're talking about because you might have a you might be in revision stage, so you might that that struggle is a bit different. But if you're still progressing to the end go forward, not backwards, be, be the new you, be the new writer that you are, but progress forward. Mm -hmm. And then you'll, that those, those cascading of voices can help you uh, find the voice overall in the end. Yeah. And you'll be doing lots of revisions so you can bring that in because I'm in that stage right now where it's just like, I, you know, and, and I just keep revising it because you'll be doing that anyways, even through your submission process, your acceptance process, just lots of revisions. So just keep bringing new, new um, rating into that, you know. Yeah. Two last questions. We're going to go, yes, I got you, Julie. I'm going to do the back row and do the first row. So uh, yes, your question, please. Um, I'm wondering if you'd like to add just a sort of running statement. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 Yeah.
read the book front to back since it was published. Um, and I go into little moments of panic when I realize that anybody could buy it and read it. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say the fear is still there. Um, <laughs> Sorry. I'm a, I'm a year ahead of you, right? Yeah. So I'm going to say just recently I was, I, and I think it was a friend of mine who's a teacher wrote me and, and he said, oh, we do these projects in the beginning of the year where they have to, the students have to talk about themselves. And he, and he said, I asked my student if I can share this. So it was a screenshot and they had my book and he was like, and I was like, who's this person? I don't need, he's like, you don't know them. Like they're because not even know. So I was like, someone I don't know bought my book and read it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and my husband told me that there was like a good reads that someone we don't know had, had a comment. Had commented. <laughs> and then there was a good read someone I don't know commented negatively. And I was like, this is so cool because I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> and it does and and yeah so yeah i think it's i finally like when it happens more than once you're just like oh and i did read someone saying that um once you give like once your art it's it's like oh, it's got its own life like it's no longer mine but it took a year for me to just be like okay it's fine no yeah, yeah. the positive i would say a, a terror absolute terror 90 percent of the time <laughs> the positive is when someone gets it there's nothing more incredible to be gotten Yes. To be met and to have someone understand your experience in your brain and relate to it. And you feel like you've touched a little bit of making the world a tiny bit better and more connected. Yeah. Uh, I, I feel too that, um, uh, you know, I, I did go on to Goodreads to look um, to see what my, and I did get several one star ratings, which I appreciate as well. It was, I actually find them a little bit humorous. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, some of the comments too, but some really good constructive feedback on the three star out of five. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think a lot of people realized it was a YA book. So I was like, okay. Um, but I, I just find the constructive uh, feedback on Goodreads is actually really interesting. Um, and I do appreciate it because a lot of it was like stuff that I thought about while I was writing. I was like, yeah, you know, it is like, you know, the, because it's such a short format, you know, there's not really a proper plot arc or it is hard to do a proper plot arc. So that, you know, that was a little bit of a challenge and people are saying, oh, I wish it was longer, you know, and I'm like, oh, well, that's kind of complimentary in a sort of, you know, almost like, you know, good way, um, <laughs> I hope. <laughs> um, but so those kinds of things, I think also too, I remember when I was first started out at TWS, I was so scared to read and it was, I think all of us probably were at some point. And, uh, but the more times you do it, the easier it gets. And then like Sarah mentioned, when you do get, even just, I thought if one person enjoys this book, like, yay, you know, that's a good thing. So like, you know, when you do get people coming up to you and saying, you know, oh, I really enjoyed this book or my daughter enjoyed it or whatever. And I was like, thank you so much. And then I was like, good, I don't really care about all the other stuff. And then, you know, when you do go back and read your stuff, like um, Amelia was saying like later on, or at least for me, sometimes I look at it and go, oh my God, that writing is so awful. Like, ugh. right. And then, but then you do, you just keep on continuing to write better. You know, you just have to let it go basically is what you have to do. You just write it. And, you know, like Sarah was saying, you let it go out in the world and it is kind of like what it is. You just have to deal with it. Cause you always, when you're a writer, you always want to do better. But how many times can you rewrite your same book? Like I'm in that revision process and I'm like, I must've written this book like 50 times already. I just wish someone would publish it. <laughs> <laughs> so. Thank you, Katie. Uh, everybody, Candy, Emmy, Sarah, Amelia, give them a big hand. And JJ, big, big hand for JJ. Thank you to the Word Vancouver volunteers. Thank you to the sponsors. Please remember to visit 32 Books and buy a copy of our lovely author's books. Um, also, uh, if you want to support Word Vancouver, don't forget, you can become a member. You can also donate and you can also participate in the silent auction at wordvancouver.ca. Thank you very much for being such a great audience. Have a great afternoon.